like the wrong you never burn. Yeah, that cow make you crazy. Crazy as a limb. just unmuted. Hello? Oh. <laughs> can you hear me? We can. I'm going to get, you want to spotlight me? Oh, great. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name's Jason. I'm here at the CCA Cinematech in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Uh, the CCA, the Center for Contemporary Arts, celebrated its 40th year last year, and uh, we've served uh, Santa Fe in northern New Mexico uh, for all that time. And tonight we've got all kinds of guests from around the world. So I wanna welcome you to the CCA Living Room, which is our virtual space. Um, I wanna send a, a shout out to a few special people who came all the way from around the world. Santi from Ecuador, Bernadette from Switzerland, Costanza from Hungary, uh, Maribel from Spain, uh, Millie and Vicky from the UK and Alia from Kuwait and a couple dozen other international attendees, people from all around the country too. We're really grateful to have you here with us virtually in Santa Fe. Um, this is gonna be a wonderful program. I'm excited to share this conversation with Ethan Hawke about Blaze, which is one of my favorite films. Uh, had a good time watching it and making some notes on it last night. Um, those of you who wanna ask questions for Ethan, there's a Q&A button um, down on the bottom of my screen, it might be somewhere else on your screen. You can click on that and then you can type in your question and we'll get to those over the course of this conversation. Um, to get things started, we are going to share a little um, outtake from the film that no one else has seen, a special just for the living room. Stand by and we're gonna get you going with some music. Well, here I sit high and get ideas. Ain't nothing but a fool to live like this. 
Out all night running wild Woman sitting home with a month old child And dang me, dang me They ought to take a rope and hang me High from the highest tree A woman would you weep for me Put it in that tail toe Thank you so much, Tom. Thank you. And please welcome to the living room, Ethan Hawke. Hello, can you see me? I can. Oh, how wonderful. Um, thanks for all that, Jason. That, uh, <laughs> that Roger Miller dang me thing of Ben in the hammock is awesome. It, it's one of the first times, you know, I've been friends with Ben Dickey for a long time and he used to sing that song to my kids. And if I had to define charisma, it would be Ben singing Roger Miller. It makes me so happy every time I see it. Yeah, you. when we were communicating, you were sending these, um, these clips, you copied me on a note to your editor and you said, I remember what a, how magical the experience was of making the film and, and that watching the clips brought you back. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, you know, it's funny. Um, the editor of this film, Jay, Jason Gershon and I worked really closely together because to be honest with you, we, you know, I had this basic idea of casting musicians to play musicians. And my thought was that probably the acting wasn't gonna go as well as we thought. And so I, I wanted to have a lot of material and, and I created improvisatory settings. And unfortunately, Ben Dickey and Charlie Sexton were amazing actors. And we were, you know, we were accumulating just vast amounts of footage of amazing scenes. Everything worked. And I didn't think that it would. And it was, Jason and I had to kind of rewrite the film as we cut it because we had so much amazing material. Uh, and Ben and Charlie and Alia and Josh and the whole gang, uh, and for some reason, because nobody was making any money and because there's something, I think part of what people love about Blaze Foley is a lack of artifice. And uh, there's something, for lack of a better word, authentic about who Blaze is and who Town was. And, uh, and that authenticity drove all of us and it inspired all of us as kind of a, Sybil Rosen is, you know, Blaze's former wife who wrote a memoir and we were working with her and, and her authenticity. She's a very, she was kind of our spiritual touchstone for lack of a better word. And it, because of their light, everybody who came in contact with the movie because they weren't being paid, was acting out of a kind of love that, shimmered the whole experience and made everything seem purposeful and exciting and, and true that so we were in this dark time that we're in right now my editor wrote me back he didn't he didn't cc you on the his response and his response was that he's been really hurting out there in la and and just even opening up his avid to look at this footage again um filled him with memories of a time that was much happier so Blaze's spirit was on set with you in a sense. You know, when you say that kind of thing, it, it always sounds corny, but I, I feel that some combination between the actor Ben Dickey and our collaborator Sybil Rosen, I, I, I feel that they conjured him. And, and as Sybil told me, I'll tell you a funny story. When I, I first had the idea to make this movie just based out of my friendship with Ben, I just thought, God, you should play Blaze. But I didn't know much about Blaze. Um, really only John Prine's song, Clay Pigeons, and other weird anecdotes that Ben had taught me. But then I found this book, Living in the Woods in a Tree, and I called Sybil Rosen and I said, hey, I want to make a movie, and what do you think about that? And she said, well, 
she said something to the effect of, well, I'll talk to Blaze tonight and I'll call you tomorrow. <laughs> you know, and, and she went through a, a, a walk in the Georgia Pines and she called me the next day and she said, yeah, we think you're Blaze's best shot. So you can have this story and we'll just make it as best we can. And, it, and she said, be careful when you invite him into your life, he'll come. And I don't know what I feel about the spirit world or anything, but I've played lots of people, you know, I've, I've played characters real life who have died and things like that, and they haven't been present. But Blaze is definitely present for the making of this movie. I have no doubt about it. So can we back up to your connection with this kind of music? Because you, you grew up as an Austin kid, so I assume that you got to listen to a lot of this kind of music. Well, I think what drives all of us is a little mysterious. And for me, my parents split up when I was young and uh, I used to go visit my father for the summers and there would always be these hot summers in Texas. And I remember, I guess it'd be 1977 or uh, the year Star Wars came out. And my father drove me in it. Chevy Barracuda, we drove out to Willie Nelson's 4th of July picnic, you know, and it made a huge impression on this young kid's mind. You know, we had uh, Navajo rugs in the back seat and we popped the trunk and sat, I sat and listened to music in the back of the trunk. And uh, I mean, who knows, I'm probably confusing memories, but they, country music was a way to be close to my father and be close to something that felt real in my life and something that had meaning to me. And, and you know, Willie is a great champion of other artists. And Willie brings you to Chris Christopherson, he brings you to Towns Van Zandt, he brings you to Merle Haggard. And if you're a geek and you start following the line, you wind up what I call the snuffleupagus of country music, which is Blaze Foley. Like, you know, Louis Black, who's a producer in the film and, you know, covered music for the Austin Chronicle, you know, when I showed him the first cut, he said, I can't believe I'm watching a movie where the most famous person is Towns Van Zandt. You realize, Ethan, most nobody knows who Towns Van Zandt is. And I'm like, yeah, I know. Is this working? Oh, there we go. Sorry about okay. that. Um, yeah. So is there, I, I get this feeling and it's a vague feeling that the film, it's a biography of Blaze, but it, the, how personal it feels when I watch it, it seems like maybe it's autobiographical too, or there's a lot of you in it at least as, a, as a, the creator of it. You know, I, I think that I've never been a fan of what people call the biopic. It kind of feels very conventional and it follows a certain formula. I in a lot of ways wanted to share, I wanted to use Blaze's music, his brilliant music, uh, let him tell the story of his life through his music and tell Ben's story. You know, I, I've been friends with Ben for a long time and the life of a musician is a tough life. You know, for most artists, whether it's painting or dance or music, whatever it is, most people, the, the, the primary feeling they encounter is indifference, right? And yet you watch biopics about artists and they're always celebrated. It's Ray Charles, it's Johnny Cash, and they follow this trajectory where they have some young pain and then they experience, they translate that pain into creativity and then they're rich and they have a drug problem and then they either die or they get sober and find enlightenment. And it, it's kind of a... I'm not saying it's not a true trajectory, but it's a very limited one. And where most of the people who are artists in this world are met with absolute indifference. And I kind of felt we could use Blaze Foley as the patron saint of your life as your art, as of, of the real life of an artist, which is not that, it's not that life is so mean to us that it doesn't go well. It, there's so much self-destruction happening as well. And that's why I felt like Blaze is the perfect uh, person to use. But yes, I related to the bipolar elements that I see in Blaze's 
behavior. I related to my friend Ben and I wanted him to put his, his spirit energy into the film. Uh, Charlie brought with him a deep knowledge of the music world and the, you know, I'm from Austin, but, but Charlie is from the Austin music scene. I didn't even know when I offered, I offered Charlie Sexton to play Towns Van Sant. I didn't even know that he knew Towns Van Sant. You know, uh, Charlie grew up trying to get to school with, you know, Blaze Foley passed out in front of the front door and he had to climb over him. Um, so, I, and I didn't even know that when I offered him the part. I didn't know what I was inviting him into. And he brought with him a deep, deep, real knowledge of the world, um, of music, and he believed in Ben. And those two created a friendship that I think you can feel on screen that was really exciting. Am I, am I, am I talking to the void? I hope uh, not. There we go. I'm, I apologize. Oh, um, no, the, 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 the performances, uh, you know, Charlie is, you know, you believe. And, um, and he's also such an incredible storyteller. And um, that brings a whole other layer of, of depth to the, to the, to the storytelling, is, is his stories within the story. Can you talk a little bit about those? Well, Let's see, I mean, there was so much, uh, for me, I wanted the movie to use Blaze's music to kind of talk about, um, in my life, in my experience, there are kind of two wells that human creativity come from. There's this one well that's really earnest and sincere and beautiful of human creativity. And it's a tree house and it's birds and it's squirrels and it's falling in love and it's making love and it's being together. And, and out of that comes the song from your heart that flows freely. And that's human creativity. That's kind of Walt Whitman creativity. And then there's this other well, which is maybe I could be important. You know, maybe I could change the world. Maybe people will talk about me after I'm dead. Um, and this well is kind of a narcissistic well, and they're kind of this uh, positive and negative polarity, and they're both extremely effective. You know, the, and, and in this movie, we're kind of using towns to represent, in Blaze's life, a pursuit of what if I could be great? What if I could be amazing and last? Um, and, and Alia's character, Sybil's character, is the other well of creativity, of love. And I, I wanted to make, for some reason, I think the genesis of this movie in some way started when I was friends with Richard Linkletter, like 19, I just finished Before Sunrise. And uh, Lewis Black was making a documentary about Towns Van Zandt and they needed some money or something, but whatever. I saw some early footage of this documentary in where I saw an interview where Towns said uh, that if you want to be a real artist, basically the equivalent, he said, you have to set yourself on fire. You know, fuck the world, fuck friends, fuck family, fuck money, fuck everything. Are you the real thing? You know, set yourself on fire. And as a young person, that was right around the time that River Phoenix died. And I was really in love with River and, um, and really hurt by his death and uh, felt very much his artistic uh, inferior. And that interview had a power over me. And funnily enough, Linkletter is very much about love and he has no patience or he's patience for it but no interest in um in that kind of self-hatred and that his friendship with me was really a powerful impact because he didn't feel that 
hating yourself or being important was really of interest. He, 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 he looks at the arts much more scientifically. It's kind of a wonderful feeling like, oh, who cares who's successful or not? We're all doing it. You know, we're all influencing each other and it's all beautiful. And there's such positivity to Rick. But I think in a lot of ways for me, the filmmaking of Blaze was about those two angels, you know? Um, and I know your question was about stories, I guess, but I, all the stories, Charlie, because of playing with Dylan for so many, you know, I mean, Charlie's got stories. I mean, he's got enough for 10 memoirs. And so he was there for, for all of us about real life stories, but we weren't really interested in pursuing the real life. We were trying to make, it's like, uh, you know, we're trying to make art about Blaze. Does that make sense? Do I yeah, talk sorry, to you? No, I'm just, no, no, you're perfect. No, we just, we're just, we're just uh, having a little mute toggle question. Should we show, you were so generous in letting us have some of these outtakes and unseen material. Do you want to, can we watch another one? Oh, please, it's so fun. Okay, hold on one sec, we're gonna queue up another one. There was this one time, Blaze and I were getting paid 20 bucks a song to play this rancher's party out in Dripping Springs. We got word that Dylan was in town. You know, we both obviously liked Dylan. And I'd also heard that he kinda liked Poncho and Lefty. The only problem was is that uh, we didn't have a car, no ride. But there was a fella on this ranch that had an old farm truck, so we could, we could borrow it. The problem was the transmission was busted. It only had first gear and reverse. First gear, you can only go about 10 or 15 miles an hour, and that's really not much better than walking. But now in reverse, you can, you can go as fast as you dare. So we, we gave it a thought for a minute, and then we, the only smart thing to do was, was to go in reverse. That's what we did. So we got in the car, we drove the 16 miles into town, and we saw this big old bus. We pulled up, and we got invited on. We went on and, uh, you know, said hello, talked a little bit. We played a couple tunes, and said adios. We went down the road. So you met Bob Dylan. You played for Bob Dylan. Man, it sure looked a lot like him. I'm pretty sure it was him. Now, drinking wine is an old, old thing. You've heard that all the kings and queens of Egypt used to sip it now and then. But they didn't get drunk and fall on the floor and turn around around smacking a door like some of these modern wine drinking men. They drink their wine from a civil mug and not somebody's old two bit jug. And they always knew when they had had enough. And the wine they drank was mighty fine, just like the juice right off the vine, not anything like this new green stuff. Buddy, stay off of that wine, although it makes you feel mighty fine. You can drink gin and beer, that's good. You can drink liquor, eat wood. Buddy, stay off of that wine. Now, nobody's gonna call you a sinner if you have a glass or two before dinner. Mm -hmm. Nobody's gonna say that you was out of line. That's right. But if you're a guy that likes to drink and you don't want to get up to where you can't think, remember, buddy, stay off that line. Buddy, stay off of that line. You can drink gin and beer, that's good. Liquor aged in wood. Remember, buddy, stay off that wine. This is my medicine, man. <laughs> so, Ethan, that's like, how can that be an outtake? It's just, it's so beautiful. It's a, it's just a wonderful, a wonderful, uh, you know, collage of images and sounds and memories and emotions, all in one. Its own little short film. Yeah, you know, I mean, I, I tell you what, it was just the hardest. Uh, the hard thing about making a movie is that 
if you're indulgent, you know, one time people say, that's an indulgent film, you know, and when you fall in love with your actors and you fall in love with the story, you really do lose perspective. You know, I mean, if you're a genius, you know, if you're Tarantino or Scorsese or, you know, one of these people who's touched or whatever, you know, everybody does love everything you do. But for the rest of us, you have to be discerning. And this whole project was a magical dream to me. And I was in love with so much of what Blaze and Towns and Sybil's life was like and what they were trying to say with their life. And I think in a lot of ways, it has to do with the generation right before me, this generation that was uh, pushing civil rights and, and pushing feminism and pushing uh, humanity and this, this kind of 70s ethos that I was born into that somehow got railroaded by the 80s. You know, it just got railroaded by money, greed. You know, it's just, uh, this, there was a kind of enlightenment that seemed like it was happening that got crushed. The, you know, the, the wind blew the other direction. And, and these people represented an ethos to me that I, I really admired. You know, I mean, I've been a big fan of Chris Christopherson my whole life. And, you know, and, and Chris is, a great example of an artist who crosses mediums, an artist who his politics are reflected in his art, but not usurped by his art. You, you know, I mean, uh, so there's something about, there's a strange part of this movie that I think that is, it tips our hat to the, to the 70s. Oh, yeah. Does that make sense? Completely, and you can completely feel it, a kind of a, a more pure moment. In, in art making. Um, so we have a question from Brock. Um, it's his middle name is Ethan. His parents watched Before Sunrise when they were engaged. <laughs> and uh, he asks about the compositions of the film, um, which were very striking, um, particularly the one in the back of the pickup truck. We just watched an outtake from along with the confrontation on the porch. Um, how did you conceptualize these and how much were driven by real accounts? How much emerged in the moment? Can you talk a little bit about, about the cinematography and the compositions? Well, I'm just so grateful to be asked that question because we have a, a DP cinematographer named Steve Cousins and he's, he's from Canada. And he, I met him on uh, the Chet Baker movie that I did called Born to be Blue. And uh, Chet was, when I played Chet was the most uh, confident I'd felt in improvising. And part of that had to do with Steve, that Steve is a very centered individual and an individual who walks through space without a lot of a judgment. And he gave me a lot of confidence. And when I was thinking about Ben and Charlie and what I, how I wanted this movie to feel. Um, I thought that Steve would create, he creates an energy on set that is not, there's this thing, I, 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 my heart breaks for young actors because DPs kind of rule the modern set. They, they, they tell young actors that their nose looks funny this way and turn here, you look intense if you do this and look up and, and everybody starts posing and Steve is uh, much more a scientist and Zen about it and isn't interested in making you worry about posing and uh, makes you feel loved, for lack of a better word. And I thought it would be really useful. And I was really right because we would get, right when we were starting, I said, oh, I want it to look like Les Blank's poem as a naked person, or I want it to look like Badlands. And, and and Steve said to me, he said, let's play a game with each other. Because, you know, we had no money. And he said, look, I'm coming to Louisiana. He's a Canadian. He does not want to go to Louisiana. Uh, I'm away from my wife and kids. I don't want to be away from my wife and kids. Do me a favor and never mention another movie to me again. It's like, I don't want to imitate another cinematographer. What I want to do is you tell me what it feels like, what it smells like, what's the memory. 
What's important? You know, it's certainly not important that we imitate Badlands. But, and so I started talking to him about um, the South. And, you know, one of the things about Ben and Charlie, and I've had normal people, I mean, not normal people, who's a normal person. I mean, I've had people that weren't working in the movie say this to me, that there's something deeply Southern about the film because of how slow Charlie and Ben speak. Um, the movie's very patient, and um, Steve was very patient, too. He was never bored with our actors, never, and always excited to let moments be and settle in and to see some kind of truth inside a moment and not pursue an agenda. Oh, I want it to look like X. So, you know, no, let's see what happens. How, what does Ben say? And there is something deeply Southern about Ben and Charlie too. And their vocal patterns lead the film and, uh, and they lead the cinematography. I mean, it was, we had some intellectual ideas I could tell you about, about, you know, relating time to different times and color and use of what we we're doing with that. But mostly the coolest idea Steve had was he said, Blaze Foley is basically a folk artist, right? And I said, yeah. He said, so why don't we be folk artists too? Let's not be fancy. We used one lens for the entirety. We never changed lenses. We put one lens on the camera. We did it as simple as possible. We changed lenses once. And it was, this was Steve's idea too. It was not mine, which is to change. The only time we change lenses is when Blaze and Sybil get married. You know, there's a shot that we do in slow motion. And the reason why that shot pops, and it does, I've seen, I mean, I've watched the movie with audiences countless times, and, and that movie, that's, that shot when they're kissing, and it's in slow motion. But it's not the slow motion that pops. It's the first time we've changed a lens, which heightens the moment. And if you only do it once, I mean, this is something I learned from Paul Schrader, too. It's like, you know, if you create a rule and then you break it, then the rule has power. Um, and so that wedding shot, we saved it to make Blaze and Sybil's love important, you know, and significant for the audience. And I, I, I really think it works. And, you know, 98% of it was all Steve's idea. The, the love in this movie, the deep affection feels so authentic in a way that I don't think I've experienced in another film before. I, it is, you really sense how much they adore each other and how much they learn from each other and how much they trust each other. Um, and it's, there's nothing artificial about it. Can you talk a little bit about how that came to be? Was it another piece of the magic of the film? Well, I, I, I just read, there's an oral history of Mike Nichols' life and I had a funny moment. I didn't really know Mike Nichols, but I did, a, I did the revival of Hurley Burley and Mike Nichols had directed the original production. He came to see Hurley Burley and afterwards he came up to me and he wanted to talk to me and he asked me all these questions about the rehearsal process. And I said, you know, it really wasn't special. You know, the director just had us do it and we did it. And, and Mike went, oh, that's a smart director. You just cast it right and let them do their thing, you know? And it's interesting. And, and, I, and I, I heard him talk about this in the, in the book that I was just reading. And I, when I met Alia about this movie, I told her that, you know, Ben was a musician and a blues musician, a great rocker from Philly and, but that, you know, he really hadn't been acting and that I would want her to help him. And she said, I, I really am into that idea. And I remember, it was amazing. Ben had this huge job in front of him, right? Playing this character. And he's, he, he learned every song that plays fully ever wrote. And he's, you know, talking to Sybil on the phone, writing her letters, and he's totally trying to do everything he ever heard that Daniel Day-Lewis ever did. He's trying to do it. And, and, and he calls me up, he goes like, I, I, I think I got this. You know, we haven't even started yet. You know, like, I, think, I think I'm gonna get this. 
I'm only worried about one thing. There's so many things to worry about, you know, like I can't imagine what, what's the one thing he's worried about. He says, you know, there's this scene where Blaze and Sybil first meet, and I just have no idea what to do with my hands. And I said, well, that's a good question. But I promise you, I remember saying this, I said, I promise you, if you just talk to Alia, you won't be worried about what to do with your hands. And of course, then Ben, all on his own, and a totally weird thing, came up with this idea of, you, you know, the, the, the lighter. I don't know where the idea came from, but anyway, he didn't have to do anything with his hands. It was one of my favorite shots in the movie is, is him doing this lighter. And of course, we didn't have a lighter, so the lighter started dying, you know, which became the perfect poetry for the scene. Um, I've, in telling a story, I've completely forgot the question that you asked. Uh, what the hell am I talking about? Um, yeah, no, you answered it more or less. But, but the authenticity of the love. I mean, you can really feel oh, it. Oh, yeah. They were so fucking good together. And they, they interacted together. And Alia was really working to, she felt, she took responsibility for their scene work of making sure that, you know, that Ben, you know, from all the boring shit of hair and makeup to running lines to the whole world that he didn't know about, to the more mysterious, more important world of communication and art. You know, I mean, they're both artists. I mean, Ali is a musician too. And I get a lot of credit in my whole life. People always think that the before trilogy is improvised and all this stuff. The only time I've successfully done an improvisation on set is in Blaze. And it was our last day of shooting. And I asked Alia and Ben to play cards together and they just talked together and they were in character and out of character and they were, the, they were doing all the things that Stanislavski would have loved, which is blurring the lines between character and performer, telling the truth and being in character. And they played cards. And we, I, I never really would have thought I would have used the scene in the movie, but the, you know, they're just playing cards and Ben starts talking about how, um, uh, about confidence. Uh, it's a beautiful, beautiful scene. And Ali is talking about acting and, uh, but it's, it's, it's magic because they were really friends. They looked after each other. It's beautiful. Um, there's a question from Jared. At what point in your process did you decide to tell a nonlinear story? And I have to say that you and I have talked about this before is um, there are a bunch of different time frames intersecting here and um, it feels both, to me, mathematical and organic, which is really magical to make happen. I, I mean, I imagine you charted this out somehow, or you figured out some way to, to figure out how to intersect all these different time frames. Well, you know, plants of mice and men, right? I mean, we did chart it out, and we did work on it. For me, I have been a big believer in the past, present, and the future as one interconnective force. You know that if you experience celebrity at a young age and people start to write about you and you watch what lies are attached to any narrative of a person's life, and people don't mean to lie. They, they, they're, they just are trying to make a narrative out of your experience this happened and that happened and then that's why this happened. And it's kind of true and it's kind of not true uh, that the past and the present and the future are always impacting each other. And I've, I've felt this pretty much my whole life that, you know, I would have these moments when I was younger when I would be, oh, you know, so angry at my dad or something. And, and then I would get more information and I realized that I was sympathetic to my father's position. And my whole demeanor, my whole back would change. And no fact had changed. It was just my, and then some other information would happen or I would have a new experience, right? I would raise kids and that would change my impact on my feelings about my father's impact on me. And 
you start to realize what Faulkner meant when he said the past didn't go anywhere, it isn't even the past, right? The past is always changing. You know, we'll look at November 2019 differently now, right? Than we did in November because of what we know now. And the same is true of love affairs or identity or whatever. And so I felt one of the powers of Sybil's book, Sybil Rosen's book, when I read it about Blaze, is she sees time in the same way that I do, uh, the same way that Linkletter does, uh, the same way that Kurt Vonnegut does, that time is not exactly the way our bodies experience it, that there's something else at work. And, and so when I first wrote the script, I did it in three different um, colors. You know, I wrote one storyline in blue and one in red and one in green. Believe it or not, because the green one was very hard to read. But so that I could see how they related to each other. I wanted the movie to not work like a, you know, dipshit biopic, um, but like a blues song, you know, where it went verse, chorus, verse, chorus, bridge. First chorus, first, you know, there's a, uh, you know, m movies and plays and books and stuff always feel like there's a A to B linear storytelling. And in life, to me, always feels more circular. And one of the things that I love about blues songs are, is that they, they kind of happen like a circle. You know, the beginning relates to the end and everything is relating more to each other. And it, it's, it feels more um, authentic to the experience of being alive to me. And so the, the structure of the movie is hunting after that. When we succeed, when we don't succeed, uh, I, I, don't, I, I don't know, but I know that's what we're hunting for. There's a great question from Andrew. Um, Blaze's character has such a distinctly poetic manner of speaking. Um, where did you draw inspiration for that dialogue? Well, I mean, I keep wondering if Ben Dickey is watching this, you know, I, I have no idea. Um, but Blaze had a very unique style of speaking, and so does Ben, you know. Yeah, there's a great line in the confidence scene that I was just talking about, the inspiration where, where Ben says, it's your constellation prize for being alive. And we all know he means consolation, but the whole idea of a constellation prize is very Ben, uh, a prize from the stars, you know. Um, and Blaze, you know, I mean, Dylan, Brecht, great artists have their own funny way of speaking. You know, they just can't be normal. And um, Ben has that, and Blaze had that, and my, my only direction to Ben was to use his own uniqueness, to not, you know, Blaze Foley already existed and, and, and you can YouTube him and you can do all that. What he has to, what Blaze had that was important for our story was wit, you know? I mean, it's, I, I saw on the internet tonight some, some people after watching Donald Trump started playing Blaze Foley's Oval Room. You know, and it's like, it's the more things change, the more they stay the same. And Ben has the same wit, but I was like, use your wit. Everybody talks about how Blaze was funny. I was like, don't be funny the way that Blaze was funny. Be funny the way that you're funny. And then we'll get the wit out. The wit's all that matters. You, you, you know, that I, I'm less interested in imitation uh, and more interested in, seeing Ben's hit on Blaze Foley. Make sense? Um, good question from Chris. Um, and this will be a good segue into our next clip too. Uh, I love the line where Sybil says, do you think we're born knowing how to love um, hmm. and then we then forget? Can you talk a little bit about that in context of the film's narrative? Well, In context of the film's narrative, um, you know, loving comes pretty easy to most of us. Uh, 
it's just somehow we want more, you know, and that's what one of the, I remember one of the things that got cut was I had a big long monologue of Blaze talking about the GDP and comparing it to Elvis Presley and now all we want is more. You know, there's a little metaphor in the play about, you know, when they're leaving, I mean, in the movie, when they're leaving the treehouse and uh, Wyatt Russell says, you know, what do you want, Graceland? You know, this, this Graceland's got nothing on this place. And the, the, the joke there is that they actually already had everything they need. I mean, whether we're talking Garden of Eden, whatever the metaphor you want to throw on there. Uh, but we, we have everything we need all the time whenever we can love. You know, whenever we can love another person and whenever we can feel love, nothing, can, nothing is ever going to be better than that. And, and, but somehow we want it to be ours or to control it or, I mean, I think one of the strange things about the period we're living in right now is we're having a harsh slap in the face about how we don't control the universe, right? It doesn't matter how much money you make, it doesn't matter, like, it doesn't matter. Uh, the earth can cough us up and spit us out and we're, it's a gift to be alive. And, but for most of us, it's not enough. And it's a mystery, and that's, that's the story of Adam and Eve or whatever you want, it's just not enough. Ah, it's awesome, life is perfect. But I want a little more than my friend, you know? I want a little more than, uh, my, you know, my parents. I want a little more than my neighbor. I want, I want people to like me a little bit more than they like my brother, you know? And it's like, it just causes us so much pain, you know? And, uh, I was hypnotized. That scene was written out of a, it's just fascinating in Sybil's book. She just can't remember exactly the day or why they'd ever decided to leave the treehouse. You know, and, and, and I think for, for my money, it's that when we're young, we think we're going to have so many amazing experiences. You know, we're going to meet so many amazing people. It's, it's the, that this one is maybe not that great because there's going to be so many down the road. And, and then you, you know, Sybil's older now. And she's like, wow, being in the treehouse of the place fully is pretty great. Why did I leave? That's a perfect segue to another clip. Thank you again for sharing these with us. And uh, we're going to check out this next one. Welcome back to Country Roads. We have with us today Towns Van Zandt singing his pal Blaze Foley's If I Could Only Fly. Things will be better. 
dismal thinking on a dismal day. It's a sad song for us to bear. Everyone is cheering, by the way, right now in their privacy of their own living rooms. <laughs> such a beautiful, the segment that uses that song in the film is so beautiful. And that's just such a, you know, it's such a beautiful collage. Um, there's two questions, one from Clint and one from our friend Alex about Z. Z, a composite character. And also um, talk about his, his role in the interview. I, I just, I love his skepticism and, and you know, almost like a poker face skepticism. You can just see a little kind of creeping in there. And Josh Hamilton's wonderful playing that role. And Josh Hamilton is a great actor in, in a lot of ways. What Z, Z is Gurf Morlix and a handful of other people who were friends and took care of Blaze. You know, he represents the force of friendship of musicians who, uh, who took care of him and Gurf, recorded the, I mean, Gurf got the tapes of the Austin Outhouse things that if it weren't for those recordings and him taking care of them, I, I would have never heard of, would have never been able to make this movie. And, uh, but, but, you know, I needed a character that could not have any historical accuracy at all so that I could tell the story better. And I also really, in truth, needed Josh Hamilton and I started a theater company. I met Josh. Josh auditioned for Dead Poets Society. That's when we met. And we've been friends ever since. And uh, we did Tom Stoppard's Coast to Utopia together. We did Sam Mendes' Bridge Project together. A lot of theater. I mean, we did Early Burley together. I mean, I had too many plays to count. I mean, it would take me, I mean, I don't know, somewhere between 10 and 20 plays I've done with Josh. And he's one of the greatest I don't know, uh, thinkers and lovers of acting. And I knew that what Ben needed, you know, the thing that a lot of people don't understand about acting is it's a little bit like sports a lot of times is that the person, for LeBron James to shine or Michael Jordan to shine or whatever, you need a team that is actually facilitating Michael Jordan. You need it. And I knew that we needed Ben to shine and we needed plays to be a special thing. And I knew that Ben was a new actor. Yes, he could bring his knowledge of music and he could, you know, and that was essential. But we needed to offer him, uh, make him safe as an actor. And Josh has been my greatest ally and resource and thinker for people, uh, I don't know, there's a movie called Eighth Grade, Josh was in last year, it's just awesome. And Josh is amazing in everything he does, but he was basically, uh, you know, Ben's scene partner, you know, and, and Charlie's scene partner. And, you know, doing those interviews, Charlie, you know, Charlie's playing guitar with Bob Dylan most of his life. Um, and Josh has spent his whole life in off-Broadway theaters. And I knew I needed, uh, Dennis Hopper like performance out of Charlie and I needed somebody to give him the ball just when he wanted the ball and run lines with him in just the right way and help Charlie figure out exactly what he should have in his hands and what it you know Josh is super good at understanding character and meaning and how to transmit that um, and funnily enough Josh is one of those people like a really great point guard Oftentimes I've done plays with Josh when maybe I got a great review and uh, I knew it was to Josh's credit, you know, he, he, he manages, he's sometimes too good an actor. He disappears and he facilitates other people so beautifully. Um, and it's a, it's a major gift. And he was one of the first people I called when I was putting this together as, and I, and he knew Ben's music. And I told him about Ben and, and this idea and Blaze. And, and he said, oh, I'm in, I'm in, I'm in. I'll be there, I'll be there. I'll help make this work. 
and so it was kind of essential to the um what do you call it the, the architecture of the cast you know i had josh and alia who were both child actors i mean they, they live and breathe acting they know they know a lot about it and i had ben and charlie who knew a lot about the blues you know? um and and together we made an ensemble that that could that could do something you know that could worth watching i hope it's beautiful. Um, Aditya from um, India. I love the moment where Blaze is singing and the woman keeps shouting, where's town? <laughs> um, and it's, she says it's a funny, sad and poignant moment. Um, what does it take for an artist? What kind of resilience does it take to keep going um, when you get that kind of response? I don't know, you know, Again, I hate to be corny, but thank you for saying that because it's kind of my favorite moment in the movie. If I had one is we do this, you know, he, he, Ben plays, um, you know, picture postcards, can't picture you is, you know, and it's, it's the most beatific moment of the, of the movie where we cut the montage of living in the tree house as a song and the song ends and the, you know, you know, any Neil Young, <laughs> you know what I mean? It's just like, and it's, it's it, anybody who's been in the arts understands that feeling. It's like you make a painting, you're like, it's almost like this Matisse thing I saw. Or, you know, I, I remember a couple of years ago, I was doing Macbeth and, and it, you know, invariably you'd walk out to sign people's playbills afterwards and they go, you know, I saw Patrick Stewart do this. He did it really well, you know, and, and it, it's just, and I've seen my friends play music over and over again. And, I mean, you know, they can sing some song about their mom dying and the pain they felt. And as soon as it's over, somebody from the back would yell, Leonard Skinner! You know, it's just so depressing. <laughs> do you have any recommendations about what, what a young artist might do to, to maintain and under that kind of, you know, negativity? Oh, well, you, 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 you have to somewhere fundamentally understand that you know, you can go on to any porn site you want and see something that's got like 2 million hits, you know? People pay money to watch you cut the head off. I remember my stepfather saying to me when I was first getting into it, my stepfather was a, is a great man and he taught me a lot about the arts. He kept saying the thing he hates about movies, if you want to get people's attention, you know, just pull out a gun or rip off a woman's top, you know? And it's just really easy. It doesn't mean you're making art. You know, and it doesn't, and so likewise, if you're making something beautiful, it doesn't mean anyone's going to notice or care. I mean, the world is mysterious and, and there's a powerful force for negativity and there's a powerful force for beauty. And they're at work all the time. And you, there's so much mediocrity that is celebrated and there's so much, uh, greatness that is ignored and there's greatness that's celebrated and i mean you know what i mean it's like everything's confusing you have to rilke says it's best you, you know like that i have a, a daughter who's 21 and she's fallen in love with the arts and you have to steal yourself you know you you know if you want affection you've come to the wrong job because no matter how much affection you get I mean, I'm sure, I don't know what it's like to be Bob Dylan or something like that, but it's, it's, it's a never, I mean, well, he's an exception, I, I probably, but it, 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 you, you've got to do it because it needs to be done. You know, we all sit around and re read Emily Dickinson and, and we, we know what it means and we know that she was ignored and we know that you know, the people who, ah, whatever, I don't need to take the piss out of anybody. You know what I'm trying to say is that, uh, all right, here, here's what I'm trying to say. I was, I loved Paul Schofield. This is a, let me, I'll get a little metaphysical with you here. Paul Schofield, I don't know why, I saw Man for All Seasons when I was a little kid, and you know, this Robert Bolt play, and it's so powerful, and he seemed like the moral center of the universe, Paul Schofield, and I actually played a bit part on Quiz Show, and I got to meet him, and 
was really impressed by him. And, and when he died, I read his obit, and I can't remember if it was in The Guardian or something, but he, they asked him, or they, they were quoting from an interview in which somebody had asked him why he didn't act in movies anymore or why he didn't act in the West End or Broadway, that he'd been, he was only acting in his local church. And he said that I only act where I can walk there. I, that's, that's where I want to be, where I can walk there. And, and they said, but it's important that people see your work. And he said, is it? Said, people see a lot of things and they don't, it doesn't really matter. He says, in truth, I've realized, you know, he was in his 80s and he said, I've realized that I've actually, whatever force made me, that's who I've acted for. And they see me all the time and they don't pay. And that's who I've actually always been doing it for. And I can do that here where I can walk to. And I, I, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, please forgive me, but that, that was how I was impacted by it. And so I, that always cheers me up when, you know, m movies that I care about don't make any money or can't get released or, um, friends of mine's albums can't get released or you know i was thinking you know what i don't know there's things that got nine million hits that aren't worth listening to you know uh paul from santa fe asks about one of my favorite scenes which is when blaze um and sybil and blaze's sister um talk to their dad uh, played by Chris Christopherson and to me it's a moment where um, when you're talking about how time folds back on itself and time has no it's a, a place where all of a sudden you understand Blaze in a completely different way when you see that them interact. Can you talk about that scene? With pleasure. I mean uh, uh, okay uh, many many things to talk about there. It's a huge blessing on the film that Chris Christopherson agreed to come and play Blaze's father. We knew we were trying to make a movie about legend, you know, Blaze Foley's legend. So who could be a legend's father? I really wanted something that felt legendary. You know, and and um, I wrote Chris Christopherson and told him about the movie and his wife, Lisa, who is amazing and is uh, championing a lot of what Chris is doing. And, and they said, yeah, we'll do it. And I said, look, I'm sorry, I actually don't have any money. I, I, and I mean, I, I could afford to fly them from Hawaii to Louisiana, but I couldn't pay them or, you, you know, anything. And they said, that's fine. We're really excited to do this. And, um, it felt for all of us involved, I mean, you just imagine, you just couldn't help but imagine the spirit of Blaze Foley going to Chris Christopherson's playing his dad. You just, you just couldn't help but smile just thinking about it. And, um, and Chris was there, and I really hope he doesn't mind me telling this story in public, but I'm gonna, uh, is we did the scene, and it was wonderful, and Chris was wonderful, and uh, and he was rapped, and I gave a big speech about Austin, country music, and the significance of this moment that he would appear here for us and, and, and bless us with his presence to make this thing. And the crew gave him a blimp, and you know, he was gone, and we moved on, and we moved locations. And I don't know, 30, 40 minutes later, Lisa, his wife, shows back up and says, Ethan, can I talk to you? I'm like, yeah, just, she says, uh, Chris really wants to redo his close-up. I'm like, what do you mean? Like, it went great. She's, she's like, yeah, but Chris doesn't feel great about it. And he thinks that he could do a better job. And I'm like, oh, God, don't worry about it. He crushed it. We're happy. Right? She's like, do you really want me to go tell Chris Christopherson to get on a plane and that he didn't get to do what he came here to do, that you won't give him another chance? Is that what I'm supposed to go do? And I said, uh, no, let's, we sh let's, we'll be back there. And I go to the DP and Ben and everybody, and I say, hey, we're gonna reshoot the Chris's close-up. And DP's like, why, it was great. And, and I'm like, look, dude, 
get back on that like, like, and you have to understand when you're making an indie movie, it's like you're in a race. The idea of going backwards, I mean, you never have enough time to get the scenes you want to get. So the idea of going backwards is so hard, but like, we're going backwards. Chris wants to do a fucking close up again, we're doing it. So Chris comes in and he says, yeah, hey, uh, thanks for this. He goes, um, I'm having a tough time with my memory, you know, and I, I kind of, I kind of forgot what I came here to do. I'm like, yeah, he goes, yeah, like these, he looks at Ben and uh, Alinda Cigar, who was, you know, from Hooray for the Riff Raff, was playing his sister, and it was such a blessing that Alinda was there. I mean, anybody who knows her music, I mean, we're, I was trying to fill the movie up with blessings, you know, and Alinda was there, he said, they're, they're, they're playing my kids, right? I'm like, yeah. He goes, and my kids, they come to see me and they want to play me a song, right? I'm like, yeah. Well, when you're my age and your kids come to see you, do you know why they're coming? And I said, no, I, I don't know what you mean. He goes, every time we have to say goodbye. Because it's it might be goodbye, and I've acted a little in my life, and I really want to say goodbye to my children on screen, and that's why I came here, and I fucking forgot. <laughs> like, okay, so we 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 do the we do the scene, and and, and he he cries, and he says it's so beautiful, and I mean it's an amazing take, uh, it, subtle and beautiful, and. And what you realize is that whatever you think about older people or where they are with their memory or whatever, that's still Chris Christopherson, the artist in there, who has something to say and something he was coming here to communicate, you know? And it was powerful, you know? And, and, uh, and that's not the only story I have to say about that day. It's an incredible day. Um, so... I have a question, and uh, it's okay if the answer is no, but is your guitar nearby? Coincidentally, it is, but why? <laughs> Ben's not here. <laughs> I've, I've got nothing to do, dude. We're all in quarantine. Do you want to hear a song? I would love to hear a song. Is your son nearby? All right. Ah, I wish. My son's not here right now. Let me find a capo real quick. Hold on. Everybody, this will be wait worth waiting for. Well, you say that. Let me tell you something. I love playing music, and I have a great love of music, but I'm not a good musician. And one of the things about spending time with Ben and Charlie mm -hmm. making this movie is I really mm -hmm. learn firsthand that, that what I'm not. Um, and my respect for the life of a musician and, and, and how difficult it is to communicate and how much we all love music. I mean, God, we all love it so much. Um, uh, you know, forgive me, everybody, but for some reason, this song keeps coming to me. It's so sad, and I know I shouldn't play a sad song, Maybe I should play a different song, but I'll just, I'll play a Towns Van Zandt song, it's very sad. Sometimes I don't know where this dirty road is taking me. Sometimes I don't even know the reason why. I guess I'll keep on gambling. Little booze, little rain. It's easier than just waiting for the ground to die. One time friends, I had them all. Oh, I even had a call. He beat her with a bell once cause she cried. She told him to take care of me. She headed home to Tennessee. So it's easier than just waiting around. That. Came an age and I found a girl in a Tuscaloosa bar. She cleaned me out, she hit it on the slide. I tried to hide my pain, 
bought some wine and hopped a train. It's easy and just waiting around to die. A friend said he knew where some easy money was. We robbed a man, brother, did we fly? Passy caught up with me, brought me back to Muskogee. Two long years waiting around to die. And now I'm out of prison. Oh, I got me a friend at last. He don't drink, she does steal a lie. His name is Codeine. He's the nicest man I see. Together we're just gonna wait around. My daughter, who's 11, said, Dad, that song is so sad. <laughs> but at least the end is really uplifting. <laughs> <laughs> not, not a great plague song. Thank you. Ethan, no, thank you. I don't know why. I can't stop singing that song. It's so <laughs> depressing. Ethan, I so appreciate uh, you making this beautiful film, sharing it with us, um, all the work you do. You've been a great friend to the CCA over the years too, and, and we deeply, deeply appreciate that. And thank you for taking the time here tonight. Is there anything you wanna wrap up with? You know, I just wanna say that, um, you know, the CCA, you, you run a beautiful movie theater and um, shortly after we finished shooting Blaze, uh, Ben and I were making another movie, The Kid in Santa Fe, and. Ben's partner is the production designer on Blaze, and we'd all, three of us had had this very powerful experience making Blaze, and we were kind of in recovery making the kid there in Santa Fe, and you guys screened Paris, Texas, and the three of us went, and it, it just filled us with the joy of experiencing great art at a high level, and, and, and we went and sat at a diner and talked and you know blaze hadn't come out yet we're like wouldn't it be so fun if someday some people sat at a diner and talked about blaze and you know strange way i felt like at least at least you and i got to do it tonight and i i hope that thank you for the movie theater thank you for caring about our movie thanks for you know indulging me with all these wonderful questions appreciate it thank you I, I'm, we're going to try to have a round of applause but we don't know how it works in zoom so um don't worry about it. Don't worry what? about it. Hey, can you guys can you guys all make some noise? Oh, you have to unmute them. Okay, we're gonna. Get, oh, you guys have to unmute themselves. Um, while we're doing that, I'm just gonna um, I'm gonna just give a quick pitch for the CCA. We are currently running a, a fundraiser called Save Your Seat. It's at our website. Um, those of you who have the means, please donate what you can to keep us alive during this time. And if you have have a favorite local organization in your own community, please support them. Um, the arts need our help right now. You know, a lot of arts organizations um, are gonna be on the edge due to the loss of income from um, the virus. And so thank you for all of your support. We're gonna continue our series on uh, each Tuesday and Friday, check our website for all the information. Um, and if you guys are, are you guys unmuted? Who's unmuted? Well, I'm going to give a round of applause for Ethan, and um, we're, going to send, you, man. we're going to send you away with our last, um, our last outtake, a beautiful song. Um, stay till the very end. There's a little um, bit of joy at the end, too. Thank you again, Ethan. Thank you, Jason. Welcome back to Country Roads. We have with us today Towns Van Z Is that it?
I stood in line and left my name it Took about six hours or so Man just grinned like it was all a king Said he let me know Put in my time to the Pocono line Shut down six years ago I was living at the mission when I met Marie I can't stay there no more Town says looking for me, who small cars around. Maybe me and Marie could find a burned out man who will settle down. But I'm just dreaming, I ain't got no ride in the junkyard's a pretty good way. Job's about a half week old, besides. Says I got no more checks to show me to the home. My brother died in Georgia some time ago. I got no one left to call. The summer wasn't bad below the bridge, a little short on food that song. I gotta give Marie some kind of coat. I thought pretty good, used to hustle up a little girl. I got drunk and I woke up rolled a couple of months ago. They got my hop and they got my dollar, them low lives, so and so. Hearts cost money, I ain't got it. Stand by the chest piece running the freights every day. If this just me, I'd be headed south. A marine can't catch no train. She got some pain, she thinks it's a baby. Says we we'll have to wait and see. Deep in my heart, I know it's a little boy. Says he lost my file, gotta stay in line again. I wanna kill him, but I just say no. Had enough of that line, my friend. I head back to the bridge, feeling kinda cold, feeling too low down the line. Guess I'll just tell Marie the truth. Hope she don't break down and cry. Well, Marie didn't wake up this morning. She didn't even try. She just rolled over and went to heaven. Little boy, safe inside. Well, I put him in the sun with somebody found him. I caught a Chesapeake on fly. Marie, you know, get us out so she needs to get by and die. Marie, you know, get us out.
Christ almighty, what in the world is that? <laughs> Fuck me, Tom. Where did that come from? Notice how to zip it to do that.